You know, sometimes it's nice to be pleasantly wrong. Like that Sunday morning when I woke up with blood all over my shirt and a meat cleaver on my bedroom floor. But then it turned out the blood was actually chilli sauce from my kebab and I tried to use the meat cleaver to replicate that beer bottle scene from Big Trouble in Little China. <coughs> I mean, yeah, I did steal a car and crash it into the canal behind my local Tesco's, but that's a different story altogether. Anyway, back when the first trailer for The Suicide Squad dropped, I confidently predicted it would be a lazy, by-the-numbers sequel with a bunch of goofy characters and unfunny gags from a director whose heart wasn't really in the project. But having seen it, I'm pleased to say that I was at least partially wrong in my predictions. While it's a bit on the long side, lacks the polish and finesse of Guardians of the Galaxy, and features humour that misses as often as it hits, The Suicide Squad is generally a big improvement over its predecessor. The characters are a bit more interesting, the tone is more fun and irreverent, and it makes really good use of its R rating. It might not be James Gunn's best work, but overall it turned out a lot better than I expected. And yeah, I know that's a pretty low benchmark, but I guess that's where we're at with DC on film these days. Anyway, I'm gonna do my best to pick this film apart while keeping it fairly light on spoilers, so grab your plot armour and join me as I review The Suicide Squad. The movie opens with a beach assault on the island nation of Corto Maltese with a new team of criminal misfits led by Rick Flagg and Harley Quinn. Unfortunately, it all goes tits up and pretty soon everyone except Flagg and Harley have been killed. And I have to admit, it's pretty fucking funny watching the results of low tier superheroes with questionable powers going up against trained soldiers with automatic weapons. <laughs> Anyway, it turns out that this team was a literal suicide squad, intended to distract the enemy so that the real team could get ashore unmolested. This is where the movie jumps back in time a little bit and fills us in on the details. Basically, Corto Maltese was a haven for escaped Nazis after the war, who established a secret research base called Jotunheim, where they were working on something called Project Starfish. I wonder if that project name could prove to be a completely literal interpretation of what they were working on. Anyway, a recent military coup means that the project has fallen into the wrong hands, so Amanda Waller recruits a new squad to go in and blow up the place. This time the team's led by Bloodsport, who I'm just gonna call Not Deadshot from now on because the two men have the same basic abilities, backstory and general appearance and it's pretty obvious that he's meant to be a giant fuck you to Will Smith for not taking part. Anyway, Not Deadshot is accompanied by Peacemaker, who's basically Captain America if Captain America was a psychopathic serial killer with a toilet on his head. There's also Ratcatcher, who can control rats, which is actually a more useful ability than you might think in a combat situation. Polka Dot Man, who shoots polka dots that can vaporise people for some reason, and King Shark, which is an anthropomorphised shark that can walk around and talk, because apparently that's a thing which can happen in this universe. I would fucking love it if this character showed up in some dark, serious, pretentious Zack Snyder movie like Batman vs Superman. Anyway, I think you can surmise from this description that James Gunn decided to go all in by finding the most ludicrous, obscure superheroes he could get his hands on. And let's be honest here, it's not like they're in short supply when it comes to DC Comics. So the team's mission is to infiltrate the island, rescue Flag and Quinn if they can, and kidnap the lead Jotunheim scientist called the Thinker, who can help them gain entry to the fortress so they can blow it up. It sounds simple enough because, well, it kind of is. This isn't a complex plot that's gonna have you scratching your head wondering what mind-blowing twist is coming next. It's the same kind of simplistic story you'd get in most 1980s action movies, which is basically just a vehicle to get as many explosive set pieces on screen as possible. And to be honest, after enduring the labyrinthine Snyder cut and the goofy disaster of Wonder Woman 1984, it was kind of refreshing just to have a simple, straightforward storyline that focused more on character development and delivering fun set pieces. And I think this is where the Suicide Squad really comes into its own. The characters in this film are about a million times more likeable and fun than the grim, pole-faced cardboard cutouts of the previous movie. Ratcatcher and Polka Dot Man both grow on you throughout the film, and the more you learn about them, the more you can come to appreciate them. Polka Dot Man especially gets a great little redemption arc towards the end. 
King Shark is a fucking legend that turned out to be a lot more likeable than the trailer would have me believe, and he actually has moments of real sympathy at times. Basically, he's kind of a lonely soul who just wants to fit in and have friends. Sylvester Stallone does a brilliant job with the voiceover, portraying him like Rocky but with even more brain damage. But probably the best thing to come out of this film is Peacemaker. Whatever your feelings about John Cena touching his toes for China, the man has a natural flair for deadpan comedy that works perfectly for this character. He and Idris Elba have good chemistry together, and it's kind of fun watching them constantly trying to one-up each other like a pair of fucking immature teenagers. Speaking of which, Idris himself turned out to be way better than I expected. Based on the trailer, it seemed like he was going to be Will Smith minus the energy, charisma and flair for comedy, but actually he did a cracking job turning not Deadshot from a bitter, selfish arsehole into a heroic, compassionate leader by the end. Harley Quinn feels like a character that everybody likes, but nobody really knows what to do with. Her arc in the first Suicide Squad felt like it was taking place in a completely different movie that only occasionally intersected with the main storyline, while Birds of Prey proved that, much like cocaine and toilet duck, she's best enjoyed in small doses. The good news is that this is probably the best version of Harley that we've seen so far. She is less abrasive and annoying here, and some of her action scenes are a clear middle finger to the incompetent garbage in her own movie, but that being said, she still feels kinda superfluous to the plot. She's separated from the squad for most of the movie, and her subplot with the president of Corto Maltese felt like an annoying distraction rather than a meaningful part of the story. He was literally put in the movie to keep her occupied for an hour or so, which isn't great writing to be honest. Rick Flagg was also a bit underused. Yeah, he comes into his own more towards the end, but generally he felt like he was stepping on not Deadshot's toes a lot of the time, like the two men were basically filling the same role. And it's a shame because Joel Kinnaman's a great actor and I'd like to have seen more of him here. James Gunn's comic book movies have a tendency to run slightly long, and this one's no exception. The difference is that both Guardian movies had a shit ton of characters, places, set pieces and plot events crammed into their runtime, and were generally pretty brisk and efficient moving from one scene to the next. The Suicide Squad, on the other hand, feels kind of flabby, especially around the second act, where the plot basically stops for a while in favour of character developments. Not that I'm saying you can't slow down and take a breath every once in a while, but if it feels like your script is treading water for too long, then you probably need to work on the pacing. A good movie should effectively integrate fast-paced action and plot events to give you a story that's tight and efficient, instead of uncomfortably trying to switch from one to the other. The other aspect of this film which is a bit hit and miss is the humour. Some of the gags genuinely had me laughing out loud, especially when the team have to infiltrate a quote-unquote enemy village to rescue Flag, only to discover that they totally misunderstood the situation. Stuff like that's great, but other gags feel forced and simplistic, and for some reason a lot of that shit gets dumped on Harley. Like, she'll deliver a mildly funny punchline, then for some reason keep delivering it about a dozen more times. Timing is everything in comedy, and generally speaking, the longer your punchline takes, the less funny it's going to be. Like I say, it's very hit and miss, but when it does hit, it really does work well. And I guess that kind of sums up the film as a whole if I'm honest. The Suicide Squad seems to have been a divisive movie, with some people hating it and others having a blast with it. Personally, I fell somewhere in the middle, recognising that it did a decent job salvaging the flaming wreckage of the Suicide Squad franchise, and that it knew exactly the kind of silly, gory, over-the-top mayhem it wanted to provide. But on the other hand, it feels like a middling effort from a talented writer and director who's capable of a lot more, and probably should have spent more time revising his script before he started shooting. I went into it with low expectations, and well, as a result, I was pleasantly surprised. It's not going to set your world on fire, that's for sure, but if you're willing to disengage your brain for a couple of hours and just have fun with it, then it's probably not going to leave you bored either. And when it comes to DC movies, that's practically a ringing endorsement these days. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now.